questions to the Minister of the Environment and I call Mr Alec Easton. Question number one. The provisions contained in this important bill were prompted by public concern about the continuing harm caused by drink driving, the high number of young and other new drivers involved in fatal or serious crashes and the risks to users of quads involved in collisions on public roads. I welcome the Assembly's backing of the Road Traffic Amendment Bill as it completed its passage on 12 January. I expect it to gain royal assent later this month. In terms of drink driving, the bill makes provision for two new lower drink drive limits and also increases the likelihood of being stopped and tested by the police. A consultation paper is due to issue later this month. This will contain proposals to introduce a set of five statutory rules that are needed to bring the new drink drive measures into operation. I am confident that, with the continued support of my road safety partners, the new drink drive regime will be implemented before the end of 2016. In relation to graduated driver licensing, the objective is to ensure that drivers acquire experience and skills over time in lower risk environments. The bill provides for a mandatory six-month minimum learning period and the introduction of a programme of training to be evidenced by a logbook. It removes the current 45 miles per hour restriction for learner and restricted drivers. It also introduces a time-bound passenger restriction for new young drivers for the first six months after they pass their test. The Department is currently developing a draft programme for training and aims to begin informal consultation with key stakeholders over the coming months. Full public consultation will follow. Subject to relevant subordinate legislation being in place, it is planned that GDL will be operational in 2018. In relation to quads, it is proposed that the necessary legislation to make it mandatory to wear a helmet when riding a quad on the public road will be progressed as soon as possible in the next Assembly mandate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister how the new driver restrictions will be communicated with the public? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank Mr. East for this uh, question on a, a, a very important topic. Communication is the key to the success of anything that we do in here or that any legislation does anywhere. But I think, particularly uh, where something might be perceived as complex, and this legislation, as evidenced during the debate, as it did pass through this assembly, is quite complex and it's not as straightforward as I would have liked it to be originally, however, it was amended, which made it acceptable to the House. Therefore, a communication strategy is essential. The Department have been working on that and have already commenced groundwork uh, on that. Obviously, the main target audience here are going to be those who it immediately impacts upon. Those are new young drivers. So right away, we have been in contact with the approved driving instructors. They are going to be talking to people about this from their very first driving lesson. Uh, there will also be public information. Obviously, it's important that parents know this as well before they let uh, their children out driving. They should know the, the responsibilities that their children have in terms of what passengers they can carry and when. Uh, a lot of time will be spent on devising this strategy and as much money as we can afford will also be spent on uh, devising this as well uh, to ensure that this is successful and does have the impact that uh, this bill is all about, and that is reducing the number of collisions, fatal and serious collisions, brought about and involving young drivers carrying young passengers. Sandra Overnight. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that uh, detail. I was interested to hear about the communications because that is vital. It's all right us changing legislation here, but we need to get that message uh, down to, to the young people. But in terms of uh, those driving quads, uh, while there's a lead in time for the change in legislation for young drivers, uh, the Minister said that uh, the, the legislation change for the, it being mandatory to wear helmets if uh, you're riding quads. That is coming in as soon as possible. How is that going to be communicated through to uh, those riding quads right across Northern Ireland? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank Ms. Overend uh, for that question. I know Ms. Overend has been very actively uh, involved in her capacity as environment spokesperson, or in her former capacity as environment spokesperson uh, for the party as this bill went through 
the Assembly. Obviously, communication, again, is important when it comes to that, this aspect of the legislation, and that's the making of it mandatory to wear a helmet when riding a quad bike on the public road. I think it's safe enough to say that this won't impact directly upon as many people as the GDL. However, that's not the understate the importance of, again, effectively uh, communicating people's responsibility from here on, or well, from when the subordinate legislation is passed uh, to uh, wear helmets. I think it is important, therefore, that we do look at how we do that. Is it through a TV campaign? I am not sure that it would warrant that. However, I think it is important maybe that we work with groups that we have worked with closely again throughout this process, as the member will be aware, such as uh, the Young Farmers Club, etc., to see how they can help get the message out to their members who are possibly quad users. Thank you. Mr. Sydney Ann. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question two. You will be aware that Article 26 of the Local Government Order 1992 makes provision for a scheme of emergency financial assistance to district councils. Financial assistance under this article takes the form of grants paid by my department with the consent of the Department of Finance and Personnel. During the most recent flooding, I made emergency funds available to cover council costs incurred when responding to the needs of householders across Northern Ireland from 7 November 2015 until 31 January 2016. The scheme of emergency financial assistance to district councils also includes an immediate payment of £1,000 to householders as practical assistance to those who have suffered severe inconvenience to help make homes habitable as quickly as possible. It is not a compensation payment. Circular LG 03 2016, which provides advice on the scheme of emergency financial assistance to district councils, was issued to all councils on 29 January this year. Standard application and survey forms for use by householders and councils, respectively, are included in that circular. Claims for reimbursement must be submitted to the department using the templates provided. Application forms seeking reimbursement of expenditure relating to recent incidents must be submitted to the Department within three months of the flooding incident occurring. Claims made outside of this period will not be eligible for reimbursement unless in except exceptional circumstances where prior agreement has been reached with the Department. As a result of the most recent flooding, I will be reimbursing councils to cover the immediate payment of £1,000 to 175 households. On the 11th of February this year, I circulated the seventh version of an executive paper on flooding to my executive colleagues, seeking agreement to extend the current scheme of emergency financial assistance to councils to include recreational and community buildings, places of worship and businesses. I will continue to press my executive colleagues to endorse those proposals. I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Uh, thank you, and I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, Minister, during the flooding crisis, uh, a list at uh, Thatch College in my constituency was greatly damaged uh, and is still badly affected uh, as a result of the flooding. And I believe you may have actually have uh, visited that, uh, that particular cottage. Uh, can you tell us what further help and assistance can be given to protect and preserve uh, buildings of this type from the effects of flooding? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for that question. I, I, I did indeed uh, visit the cottage in the member's constituency. I think you could say it literally was in Upper Ban the day I visited it. Such was the extent of flooding that it and those dwelling in it had suffered. I think it is vitally important that we all work collectively, or well, government departments work collectively, to mitigate against the damage caused to households and, as I have said, uh, community facilities, businesses and churches from the damage caused by flooding. We know not just the damage that this causes, but also the distress. And I found it evident over the past couple of months of, as I visited victims of flooding right across the north, the impact that this has had, not just on their property, but also on them personally, in terms of the toll that it has taken. Uh, I know uh, my colleague, the Dard Minister, has launched a new scheme around individual property protection. I think that is very important, where grants will be available to people living in areas prone to flooding, 
for them to actually put in the physical measures to protect their property, and I believe grants up to £10,000 are available in that regard. The property to which the member is referring is a thatched cottage. It's over 300 years old, if I, if I recall. Not that I recall it being 300 years old, but I, was told, <laughs> I recall being told that. Uh, therefore, my department does have a responsibility to protect our built heritage. That's something I've spoken to, to my officials about, and I know uh, my officials have been engaged uh, with the occupants of that property. The departmental architects and NIEA architects have spoken to them to see what practical measures could be taken to preserve that important piece of our built heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given flooding is very much a fact of climate change, can I ask the Minister for an update on his stakeholder consultation for bringing forward the climate change bill, and what does he hope to achieve within this mandate? I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank Ms. Lowe, the Chairperson of the Environment Committee, uh, for that question. I know this is or the, the whole subject of climate change, and indeed the need for climate change legislation is something that Ms Lowe has been very vociferous on, certainly over the past few years during which I have uh, been Minister. We have received responses to this discussion document. The overwhelming majority of those responses do agree that we do here, as an Assembly in a, in a devolved state of Northern Ireland, do need our own specific Northern Ireland climate change legislation. It is not unanimous by any means. There are some who, who question the need for such legislation. However, that does not surprise me uh, whatsoever. What it does underline, however, is the importance of working with those groups and indeed working within this chamber with those parties who might not be or who are not supportive of the need for climate change legislation. The one thing uh, during the, this mandate I, I think that has been achieved, and it doesn't necessarily by, by me per se, but it is a growing realisation within this chamber and across the north of the fact that climate change is happening. We are contributing to make it happen, and therefore we have to make a contribution to slowing it, it down. Uh, the COP21 conference that I had the privilege of attending in Paris showed what can be achieved. The role of business in that conference showed that it can be achieved in a way that isn't necessarily detrimental to our economy. And as we move forward in the next mandate, hopefully to bring in climate change legislation here, it's vitally important that we involve business, particularly the agri-food sector. Minister for his responses so far. Many people affected by flooding have been left seriously disappointed by the executive's response to flooding in general. Does the minister agree that more could have been done, and does he agree that more could have been done to support businesses, community facilities, and churches, etc.? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for that question. I wholeheartedly agree uh, with, with the member. I referred my answer to the original question that I had recently tabled the seventh version of an executive paper seeking to extend uh, the scheme of emergency financial assistance to householders. I was seeking to extend that to uh, businesses, to community facilities and to churches. I tabled version one of that in November 2014. Not November 2015, November 2014. And we'd like to think that had that received executive approval, that those small businesses, many of whom I've visited, as I've said, who were so negatively impacted upon by the flooding uh, over this winter, would have been able to receive some sort of assistance from the government. I'm not sure that £1,000 would have gone very far to help in very many of them. However, it would have been some practical assistance from us as a government. I have visited uh, many of these businesses. I've heard very loud and very clear that they feel let down by us as an executive. All I can do is point to the efforts that I have made in, in this regard. Having sat on the paper for 13 months, the executive then voted 
for the Dard Minister and the EFP Minister to take forward the extension of this scheme. That was on the 20th of January, and we're, I'm, I'm, I'm still awaiting, despite having written for an update uh, on, on that, I'm still awaiting uh, a response to see how they proceed to extend it in order to help those who have suffered or those who will suffer in the future. Because one thing is clear now, because it has taken so long, and that is those that suffered this winter, and there were an awful lot of them, that they won't get anything. My department continues to take a range of actions to reduce deaths and serious injuries on our roads. We focus on the key causes of uh, road casualties and on groups which are overrepresented in the casualty figures here in the north. These figures do not target specific geographies, rather they are designed to target the most at-risk cohorts of the entire population and the biggest killer behaviours on our roads. As such, the Road Traffic Amendment Bill completed its passage on the 12th of January and currently awaits royal assent. The bill makes provision for a new drink driving regime and a new graduated driver licensing scheme. We will now develop and consult on a significant package of subordinate legislation to implement these new arrangements. Through its awareness campaigns, my department focuses on problem areas such as drink driving, speeding, carelessness and inattention, and on groups, again, who are overrepresented in the casualty figures across the north. I will also launch two new campaigns later this month, the first addressing mobile phone use while driving, and the second young driver distraction, particular late when carrying passengers. My department also continues to provide a range of resources and schemes to be used by teachers and schools to allow them to improve road safety behaviours in children and young people. Since April 2010, my department has awarded grant funding of over £700,000 to 90 projects through the DOE Road Safety Grant Scheme. This year, three of the projects are organisations which span the north, namely Ulster GAA, the Road Safety Council for Northern Ireland, and parents' education as autism therapists, and as such, benefits audiences right across the north. In view of that, in view that the A26 runs between Ballymena and Coleraine, I can advise that two of the projects, the Big Tele Theatre Company and Causeway Rural and Urban Network, based in Coleraine, received funding for road safety events. Uh, the Minister may be aware of a single corner on the Ballyquin Road in, uh, in particular, uh, which has been the scene of five fatalities of young men in recent years. Uh, that scene, that uh, corner was unexpectedly removed from a realignment scheme some years ago. Will the Minister now work with the DRD Minister uh, to see that uh, scheme expedited? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And th thank the member uh, for that question. That truly is a, a frightening and shocking uh, statistic, and, and, and certainly as an elected representative, never mind as Minister with responsibility for road safety policy, I would work with you and, and, and with everyone uh, to address what is, is clearly an issue at that precise location. I have uh, gone on, on the record here in, in this chamber before to speak of concerns that I had about, about the I suppose the restructuring of the government departments and where I foresee potential problems in that regard. But there are also opportunities, and I see one very much being in the establishment of a new uh, Department for Infrastructure, which will actually subsume the road safety element from DOE. So then you'll have uh, people within the same department who are responsible for road safety and those who are responsible for the road network. And I think this is very much the sort of thing that they have to be l looking at. I'm sure the member will return <laughs> in the next mandate and will uh, raise this issue with the, the, the minister to be. And like I said, hopefully I will return also, and I'll certainly lend my support to him on that. George Robinson. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, could I ask the Minister to outline what ac action his department is taking to address vehicles with de defective headlights, which may lead to increased ac accident levels on rural roads like the one given to in the Valley by Quinn Road? Uh, I th I thank the member for that question. Uh, obviously, the department does.
have responsibility for road safety and therefore does have responsibility to ensure the roadworthiness of, of vehicles, which is a causation factor in many collisions on our roads. Through the MOT, we do check the headlights on vehicles. It's one of the m most important aspects of the test, and any found to be faulty will result in an automatic fail of that test. In terms of other public service vehicles, if you wish to call them that, such as taxis or buses and indeed haulage vehicles, the department would be even more stringent in terms of testing and uh, these vehicles would also be subject to roadside checks. The police obviously are a very important road safety partner of the, the departments and they would also be monitoring our roads and looking out for vehicles with defective headlights, such as those described by the member. Much, Mr. Speaker. The Minister referred to the A26 running from Ballymena to Coleraine. Minister, the A26 also runs from Ballymena to Antrim, and that section of the road has seen two fatalities this year to date. Can I ask the Minister what input he is having to the DRD Minister's review of that section of road, and also what programmes his department is running? to educate drivers of the dangerous section of that road? I, I thank the member for that question. Uh, as outlined in my initial answer to uh, Mr O'Hashin, the department would focus its, its programmes of education that primarily on causation factors and groups who are perceived to be most at risk of uh, causing and being victims of uh, collisions on our roads rather than on specific geographical areas. Uh, I, I did also outline the opportunities that will exist within the new department uh, for infrastructure to align road safety with the responsibility for actually changing and improving our uh, road network. I am very sorry to hear again of more fatalities on our, our, our roads. Sadly, I think the fact is that every one of us or any one of us could stand up and speak of stretches of road within our own constituency where there have been fatalities on more than one occasion, and that underlines the importance of road safety in general. It underlines the importance of us getting out that message to all road users of their responsibility as road users uh, to take more care on the road, to respect everyone's journey, and to subscribe to where we all like to be, and that's to get to a point where there are zero deaths on our roads. And I call Mr. Andy Allen. Number four, Mr. Speaker. The process to modify the planning agreement was initiated by my predecessor in 2011. A public inquiry was held in May last year, and my department received a report from the Planning Appeals Commission in October. It has taken some time to fully consider the report, as it contained a significant amount of commentary and a number of detailed recommendations. However, I consider it was important to be thorough with this review. Having reviewed the report, I decided to invite comments or observations from interested parties on the noise control contour recommended by the PAC. My department wrote to all key stakeholders on the 2nd of February this year, enclosing a copy of the PAC report. The report was also published on the department's website. I must emphasise that I am not reopening the inquiry or asking for the submission of new evidence, and any comments or observations have to be submitted by the end of today, the 7th of March. I am therefore limited in what I can say at this stage, and I am not in a position to comment on the merits of the PAC recommendations. I can assure you that my officials will fully consider any further comments received and make a recommendation on the way forward. My objective for this process remains the establishment of an effective noise management system at the airport, which achieves the right balance between the socio-economic benefits of airport expansion with the need to protect the environment and quality of life for the surrounding community. It is for my department and the airport to reach agreement on any modifications, taking into account the independent recommendations of the public inquiry. Thank you, and Mr. Allen, for a Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Can the Minister give us an idea um, in the time frame as to when he will make a final decision on this? And perhaps also, I know I, I'm pushing and asking two questions here, but if he's ever given any consideration into an independent airport regulator? 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank Mr. Allen for those questions. Uh, in terms of time frame, a modified agreement is a legal document which would have to be drafted extremely carefully, with significant input from legal advisers, as I'm sure the member appreciates. It's difficult, therefore, to determine how long exactly this would take. However, it's worth pointing out that the last modified agreement was signed over two years after the report of the independent examination in 2008. And I would certainly be hopeful, in fact, I would be confident that the process can and should and would be concluded much faster than that famous last words. Uh, in terms of the need for or the benefits of an independent airport regulator, I could certainly see the merits in such a proposal. I, believe, believe, I think we discussed it previously in, in, in a question time. That will be for a future minister. It would not even be solely the, the, the Minister for Environment. It would be more a, a, a DRD matter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his update. And can I seek his reassurance that the legitimate concerns of residents are being given uh, due consideration uh, within the task of devising uh, a coherent, transparent and enforceable noise control mechanism uh, for Belfast City Airport? I uh, thank Mr. Little for that question. As I outlined it in my initial answer the importance of striking a balance here. I have met residents on, on more than one occasion and I am fully aware of their concerns. They are justifiable and justified uh, concerns. They have uh, suffered in the past what they perceive to be breaches of the existing agreement and obviously have concerns that any new agreement might be subject to similar uh, breaches. Therefore, their concerns will be taken on board and hopefully a balance that suits them, that satisfies them, uh, be struck along with, as I said, the socio-economic benefits, the undoubted economic benefits of airport expansion and what that offers, not just to Belfast but to the whole of Northern Ireland. Mr. The Kian Corlea with Moe has fostered as an hour of his game, Gach Rathbart, hour of his two Gerias and Fost. Um, of course, we wish to, want to wish the Minister well as he finishes his last uh, question time as Minister for the Environment. And you and I, Minister, have discussed Belfast City Airport and, and, the, and the inquiry. I'm just wondering, are you disappointed that we didn't get a resolution in this mandate? And uh, will you then lend your support in the new mandate, whatever your position is? And hopefully you'll be back uh, into getting a resolution off this thorny issue. And I do know this is something that uh, Mr. O'Mullior has raised uh, with me before. I am naturally disappointed that this has not come to a conclusion during my time as Minister. I have a couple of weeks left, but I think that might be a wee bit hopeful or optimistic to think that we we'll get it sorted by then. Uh, However, it is something that will come to a conclusion. Like I say, I am certainly confident that it will not take as long as the last one, which was uh, over two years, and it is certainly something that, that, that I would be supportive of as well, be it in terms of ensuring protections for the residents, but not overly inhibiting the ability of the airport to expand and develop. You want to call Mr Jerry Kelly, and there may not be time for a supplementary. Uh, Kirsten, a quick question for you. My department received a permitted development notification from Infrastrata PLC on the 28th of August 2013, detailing their intentions to carry out an exploratory borehole at Woodbourne Forest, Carrick Fergus, to understand the subsurface geology and identify areas for potential oil and gas deposits. My officials carried out an EIA determination under the Planning Environmental Impact Assessment Regulations 2012, based on the information provided at that time, which concluded that the proposed development did not need to be accompanied by an environmental statement. My department wrote to Infrastrata on the 19th of December 2013, confirming that, based on the information submitted, the proposed borehole was permitted development and therefore planning permission would not be required. If the company does find oil or gas and wants to extract it, then it would need to apply for full planning permission from the Council. The legal position is that my department 
has no jurisdiction in relation to the permitted development notification, as this is a matter for the relevant Council, in this case, Mid and East Antrim Council. Therefore, in September 2015, I wrote to Mid and East Antrim Council, advising them that following the transfer of planning functions to local government, the subject permitted development notification was now a matter for the Council. I advised that the only means of potentially removing permitted development rights at this stage is for the Council to carry out a further EIA screening exercise in relation to the notification, taking into account whatever further information it considers appropriate. This course of action would likely require consultation with other bodies, and I encourage the Council to give careful consideration to this matter. Thank you. And that ends the period for list questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. The member listed for topical question one has withdrawn their name within the appropriate time frame. So I call Mr. George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, could I ask the minister to outline his department's expenditure on protecting built heritage under his ministerial period in charge? Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member uh, f for that question. While I don't have that exact uh, detail to hand th th this afternoon, what I can say is that over the past few years, be it under Alex Atwood, my immediate predecessor and party colleague, and myself, there has been record expenditure by the department when it comes to the protection and promotion of our built heritage. Uh, we, as a party, the SDLP, and I know it's not us exclusively, recognise the value of our built heritage, not just for its intrinsic heritage value, but also its value uh, to our economy. For every one pound invested in our built heritage, a further seven pounds spend can be generated. A fine example of that uh, exists in my own constituency, where on Friday, myself, along with the Deputy First Minister, and sadly, the member's party colleague, the DSD minister, couldn't attend on that day. I visited a, a new hotel. Its official opening was on Friday in a historic building within the city. The speaker will be well aware of it. By revitalising what was a derelict but listed building, we have now drawn and spent investment from a charitable trust and, as a result, opened a new hotel, brought new life into the city centre and created 60-something jobs in the process. This year, and the member will be aware of the tough budget cuts that my department faced, all departments faced cuts, none faced any as great as mine. Uh, I was very restricted in what I could spend on built heritage. However, through the carrier bag levy money, I was able to ring fence half a million pounds to spend on built heritage projects, which I have done. Uh, I have ring fenced a similar amount of money to go over to the new Department for Communities for Built Heritage Projects also. Mr. Robinson, for some. Could I thank the Minister for his reply and could I ask him to give a reason why he and the NIE have refused to help two pensioners with critical repairs to their thatched cottage home and a vital part of our built heritage in the Gilligan area after the Minister visited the pensioners and promised to do everything he could for them? but for some reason refused to meet with my colleagues and I about the dire situation these pensioners are living in. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank Mr Robinson uh, for that question. I did indeed uh, visit the constituents of the member at Sea Coast Road in McGilligan and, and saw at first hand the conditions in which they live. Uh, the, the member states that the department had refused to help these constituents of his. However, our records will show that as far back as 2008, uh, the, these pensioners, I'm not sure if they were pensioners then, but were encouraged to apply for listed building grant. Unfortunately, they did not do it at that time. They did not do it at any time between 2008 and 2015 when they finally did make an application. As I've already referred to, Members will be aware of the tough uh, budgetary situation my department has faced and the lack of uh, money for such projects. I said I had ring-fenced £500,000, managed to get that out of the carrier bag levy. Regrettably, while this was able to benefit some projects, legislation dictates that any money generated through the carrier bag levy can only be spent on projects 
that have a community benefit. Unfortunately, this uh, particular house does not meet that or match that criteria. What we have done, though, and my officials have been very proactive in terms of working with the residents of the thatched cottage and bringing in other government departments, including uh, DSD, uh, the minister the minister of which is the member's party colleague, to get the housing executive on board to ensure that something can be done to help these people. I'm going to have to remain the minister with the two minutes. The clock was, uh, oh, you're usually 1.59. Uh, can I call Mr Paul Gervin? Thank you, Minister, and thank you, uh, Mr Principal, Spe Principal Speaker. Uh, just, I would like to ask the Minister in relation to uh, illegal landfill sites and uh, the work that has been undertaken by his department to uh, deal with illegal landfill sites, and is there any other sites have been identified that have been used for dumping of municipal waste which has come across border? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank, I thank the member for his question. I'm somewhat taken aback. He had an opportunity to ask me a question and didn't ask me about fish kills <laughs> or the Glenavy uh, River. Uh, I, I take it the member is referring to the, the patri repatriation of waste in terms of the 19 sites that had been identified across the north where waste from the south had be, been discovered to have been illegally dumped. It is my understanding that now some 11 of those sites have been cleared. A further three sites are being identified for clearance next year, uh, and, and work is ongoing between my department and their counterparts in the south, not only to identify which sites should be cleared, but where the waste should go from the clear sites uh, as well. In terms of the identification of new sites, there, there haven't been any new sites identified, as far as I'm aware, and I hope there are no new sites. The scourge of illegal landfill is something that has blighted uh, the north, and not just the north, for, for quite some time. I'd like to think that steps taken during my time as minister have reduced the likelihood of such uh, incidents occurring again, or certainly on, on the same scale. For supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer thus far. We are very keen to go into something in relation to fish kills, but I will steer away from that at the moment. I thank the Minister for his assurance that there have been no further sites identified, and I take some comfort from that. It is in relation to uh, recovery of costs associated, because uh, I appreciate there is extensive costs associated with uh, clearing of sites uh, and disposal of the waste. Has there been any mechanism to recover costs from either where it's been dumped or where it has come from? I thank the member for that question. Like I said, work is ongoing and negotiation ongoing between uh, 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 officials on both sides of the border on this regard. I do know and the, the member might recall a statement or pub press release from uh, my counterpart, the, Repub the Republic's uh, Environment Minister last year, on the fact that waste, particularly fuel laundered waste, was polluting their water courses and uh, been having to be cleared from the side of their roads, and that it was emanating from the north, and that we should have to foot the bill, or our assembly should have to foot the bill for the clearance of those. That is something I actually resisted, and resisted qu quite strongly. I, I, I do think, though, that there has to be increased and enhanced collaboration on both sides of the border, not just in terms of who picks up the bill for what, but in terms of eradicating waste crime altogether. The Minister will be aware that our party has had a number of meetings with the Environmental Agency and the Department in relation to funding of the Colin Glen Trust in West Belfast. Uh, and in light of the plans to develop the trust and the Colin Glen Forest Park, can I ask the Minister if his department will support the trust in its efforts to secure funding for its project? I thank the, the member for that question. Well, the transfer of ownership uh, to which the member refers has been taken forward through community asset transfer, and that's something I'm sure all of us will have heard of, but very few of us actually experienced, because this is the first such transfer under the process, so we're really breaking new ground and 
exciting new ground, but it requires an economic appraisal to be approved by the FP. The economic appraisal, considering options for the ongoing tenure and management of the two parks, has been finalised so it can be forwarded to DFP, whose approval is required for the disposal of the land at nil cost to a Colin Glen Trust. My department is also in the process of drawing up the legal contract for the transfer, and this contract will be issued once DFP approval has been received. I am very hopeful that will be by the end of, of this month. A delay in finalising the economic appraisal, however, means that it, that it has been difficult to ensure completion to date, but like I say, I am confident that we can do so before the end of financial year. I have been supportive, as indeed has my predecessor, Alex Atwood, was extremely supportive of uh, Colin Glen Forest uh, Park and, and the trust there, and, and I can assure the member that I will be as supportive as I can also. Thank you. I call Mr Sheehan for supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. And would the Minister agree with me that this project has the potential to enhance tourism, create jobs for local people, and to help underpin the local economy? Uh, nah, I thank the, the, the member for that question, and I agree entirely with his assessment of the virtues and, and value of this project. Had the trust not been able to convince me of saying then that we wouldn't have got to this stage, let's say, but the product they have there really is it really has to be seen uh, to be believed. What they have done there uh, is truly amazing, and I wish them every success when they take ownership uh, of that land. It's vitally important though that we don't just give them the asset and, and, and cut them loose. If, you, uh, if I could put it like that, so I know they have had an application also in for our new natural environment fund. It's important that we look at ways that we can support uh, the, the, the trust to maintain the property in the, in the way that they have to date. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the minister will be aware that the, a number of charitable organisations. Uh, uh, or exempt from paying planning fees, has the Minister looked at the possibility of other charitable, organi charitable organisations, including churches, being included in the list of organisations that are exempt from planning fees? Ah, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Thank Mr Irwin for that question. Quite rightly, he identifies that under current planning fees regulation, a fee is not payable for a number of types of application for planning uh, permission and, and exemptions. That, like he has referred to, are available for clubs, societies, and other organisations where the club, society, or organisation is not established or conducted for profit, or where the application relates to the provision of community facilities, including sports grounds and playing fields, and where the planning authority is satisfied that the development is to be carried out on land which is or is intended to be occupied by the club, society, or other organisation to be used wholly for the carrying out of its objectives. I think this was a good move uh, when I waived planning uh, fees for these type of organisations and for this type of activity. It's something that can only benefit the community as a whole, and I think it's something that has proved successful to date. However, there is an anomaly and the churches haven't been in included to date, and that's an anomaly that I will strive to correct between now and the end of my tenure. And I call Mr. Irwin for a sub. I thank the minister for his uh, answer, and can I uh, have an assurance from the minister that he will? Ine inevitably, we're, we're almost at the end of a, 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 a assembly term. The minister will look in this as soon as possible. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Erwin. I can assure the member that I'm not just fobbing him off, and I can announce today that I am tasking officials in my department with taking forward a formal review to consider options for extending the existing fee exemption to churches and to look more closely at the issues in involved. This follows a number of representations and a number of representations from the member himself uh, regarding the current fee exemption for applications for planning permission for not-for-profit clubs, etc. I have to say that I have sought legal advice on this matter previously, and the DSO's advice has come back that 
churches aren't included as it is. That's not my reading of it. I had a recent meeting with the chief executives of all uh, the councils who now have responsibility for the vast majority of planning applications, as the member will be aware, and have asked them to maybe seek their own legal advice on this issue uh, uh, as well. It's something I believe that is an anomaly, and it's something that I believe we can iron out. And, uh, that brings us to the end of uh, topical questions and question time. Thank you, Minister. And the, the House just takes its ease while we change the top table.